Though most of Baguio's written history usually begin with the arrival of the Americans in our country, it was actually the Spaniards who first stumbled upon this hidden paradise and realized its potential as a health and recreational center. But while the rest of the country easily fell under Spanish control, the colonization of the Cordilleras didn't come as easy. In fact, it took more than two centuries for the Spaniards to finally have control over a significant part of the Cordilleras. Up until a greater part of the 1800s, and already in the third century as rulers of this country, and having already built an expansive empire covering parts of the Americas, Pacific, and Southeast Asia, the Spanish conquistadores have humiliatingly failed to subjugate the Igorots. Thus, for the most part of the Spanish occupation of our country, the Cordilleras remained independent. In fact, as early as 1630, Fray Juan Medina, a Spaniard, had already conceded that these mountain people are the most unconquerable of all the natives of this country. Barely 50 years from the time Magellan landed in Mactan, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, who in 1565 had already claimed the Philippine archipelago for Spain, heard of the rich gold deposits up in the mountains of northern Luzon and organized several expeditions to the Cordilleras. Among these expeditions were some led by his own grandson, Juan de Salcedo. Known for his daring and dynamism, de Salcedo began preparing to search for the famed Igorot gold in 1571. But conquering these mountains require much more than just mere bravado. In 1576, de Salcedo died at a young age of 27 while on a journey to the Cordilleras. So for the next 200 years, the Spaniards carried out a series of expeditions to get their hands on the region's riches. Said to be located between two rivers, the Agno and Bued rivers, the Igorot mines were said to be the wealthiest in our country. The first major expedition that actually made it close to Baguio was the one led by Captain Garcia de Aldana y Cabrera, then governor of Pangasinan in 1620. In that expedition, they were able to survey the gold mining areas in Benguet. Another expedition was undertaken four years later under the command of Don Alonso Martin Querante, who was able to reach a mining area now known as Antamok Itogon. His report on this expedition, though done through the myopic eyes of a foreigner, provided a glimpse into the way of life of the Igorots. His biased report included his observations on the people's death rituals, their clothing, their, their belief in the pagan god Kabunyan, and their, their crude mining methods. He further added that the Igorots were illiterate and had no system for the reckoning of time. Well, the Igorots may not have followed the Gregorian calendar, but they did have their own system based on the appearance of migratory birds corresponding to the different seasons and the various agricultural phases in a year. In the third quarter of the 1600s, then-Governor-General Diego Salcedo described the enduring freedom of the Igorots as scandal and a mockery, an embarrassment that right in the heart of the colony, in the main island of Luzon, natives remained pagans and their gold remained unreachable. The Igorots, with their proud warriors who for generations successfully protected the mountains against foreign invasion, indeed seemed unconquerable until they dared defy a national tobacco monopoly established in 1781. The monopoly involved controlled leaf production, supervision of all processing activities, and heavy taxation on cigars. And after years of dependency on the motherland, the monopoly made these islands a financially self-sufficient colony. Lowland smokers look for cheaper tobacco and the tax-free supply of the Highlanders satisfied that demand. At first, the Governor General's reaction was kind of lukewarm. His directive was to simply confiscate the illegal tobacco of the Igorots. No arrests, no jail time, just confiscation. For a while, this was done under the command of Commissioner Lalama of the Tobacco Monopoly of Ilocos. But merely confiscating the goods from the Igorots proved ineffective in stopping the illegal trade, for after each raid, the Igorots would simply move their plantations deeper into the mountains. In 1796, exasperated by two centuries of failure to overcome the Igorot resistance, and now insulted by their daring defiance of the tobacco monopoly, a full scale invasion of the Cordilleras was proposed. But the directive took about three decades to bear fruit. 
In January of 1829, a series of raids was conducted under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Guillermo Galvi, Commandant of El País de Igorotes y Partidas del Norte de Pangasinan. It was not going to be an easy task for Galvi. It took 45 expeditions over a period of 10 years for him to get a glimmer of success. Slowly, Galve pushed his way up and into the mountains. The first to fall was a settlement in Tuba, where he established a cuartel in 1838. The conquistadores were able to reach an area called Cafaguay, and from there entered what is now known as La Trinidad. From the present city limit between Baguio and La Trinidad, they followed the Balili River, turned left to Pico, going around the valley, and finally emerging in Wangal before proceeding to Tublay. 